Hi, I'm Maria. Hi, I'm Kyla. And, and we're, we're biologists, biologists with the Pacific, Pacific Salmon, Salmon Foundation. Foundation. Kyla is going to start the presentation, and I'll be back in a bit. Salmon are incredible creatures who migrate from salt water to fresh water to carry out their life cycle. We call salmon anadromous because they make this long trip from ocean back up to the rivers where they were born to spawn. The salmon life cycle starts when they emerge from their eggs hidden in patches of gravel in the riverbed. As tiny juveniles, they make their way downriver into estuaries, doing lots of growing along the way. Estuaries are important habitats where their bodies adjust from being in fresh water to the salt water of the ocean. Then they spend one to four years in the ocean, migrating all the way up to Alaska. When they're ready, they begin their long journey back up to the river where they were born to spawn. In the wild, salmon alevin emerge from their egg sacs in the reds of freshwater streams, rivers, and creeks. They develop and grow into fry during their outmigration to the marine environment. Functioning freshwater habitat is essential for these juvenile salmon to be able to make it to the marine environment and to their next life stage. Since salmon use stream habitats during the very start of their life and the end of their lives, they have a lot of habitat requirements. Freshwater habitats include rivers, lakes, streams, and creeks. Water in rivers, streams, and creeks all flow downhill, moved by gravity, with rivers being the largest in size and creeks being the smallest of the three. Think of this water as draining off of the landscape. We can think of lakes as pools of water that are connected by rivers, streams, and creeks. Let's take a closer look at the freshwater habitat and what makes a good habitat for salmon. So get ready to put your science hat on because you're going to learn a lot of new vocabulary in this video. One word we're going to talk about in a few of these slides is gradient. Gradient refers to the slope or the steepness of the stream. High gradient in streams means it's really steep and the water runs faster. Low gradient means the stream water moves slower because the stream is not as steep. Now that we know that term, let's learn about the different parts of the stream that make up the salmon's habitat. Riffles are areas of turbulent, fast-flowing water. You can hear water flowing when there is a riffle. They're typically shallow, not too steep reaches within gravel or cobble substrate sticking up through the surface of the water. Riffles can be salmon spawning habitat or areas where salmon lay their eggs. This is called spawning gravel. Riffles also help aerate the water, which means it brings oxygen into the water, which improves the water quality. Pools are areas of deep water in non-steep areas with gradients close to 0%, so almost not at all. Think of them as rest stops for salmon along their migration routes. Pools are evidence of where the flowing water has eroded the sediment away to create this deep area. This can happen when water flows over or around obstructions in the stream. Obstructions can be things like large boulders or large pieces of wood. Pools come in many sizes. Some are small and can be found on either edge of the channels where water has eroded an area behind a relatively small obstruction. This is called a scour pool. Pools can also be large and span the entire channel width. And this can happen if there is an object like a big log that is resting across the entire channel. And this is what we call a dammed pool. When we look at a stream to see if it has good salmon habitat, we need to consider the amount of rest habitat, or pools, compared to the amount of riffles. If you were a juvenile salmon living in a stream, how would you use pool habitats? What if you were an adult salmon? How would you use pool habitats in the stream? For juvenile salmon, pools offer a safe space for them to feed and grow bigger. For adult salmon, pools are like a rest stop on their big migration up to their natal spawning grounds. Natal is just a sciencey word, meaning the streams they were born in. All right, so we have talked about important parts of the stream for salmon, like pools and riffles, for example. Now we're gonna talk about glides. What could that be? A glide is an area of smooth or non-turbulent, but fast flowing water. They're often found between pools and riffles, which we call an elongated transitional zone. Glides are areas of the stream that are moderately shallow, flat bottom water with smooth laminar flow. Laminar is just a sciencey word for smooth. 
These parts of the stream are excellent, smooth migration straits for salmon. Cascades, or waterfalls, can be found in streams for a number of reasons. Sometimes they are steep, sharp drops in a stream, a gradient of more than 4%, or they occur when bedrock, cobble, or boulders are so big that they make waterfalls in the channel. When we see cascades, we know there is evidence of force. Force creates the flow of water and creates erosion in the stream. Over time, fast flowing water erodes the surface it flows over. And over the span of many, many years, that flow will wear down stream bed where the water flows through it. Cascades can be small like this small drop in the stream, or they can be as large as Niagara Falls. Cascades can create obstacles for salmon along their migration routes, but salmon are amazing. They can jump over some pretty incredible barriers. Streams can also be characterized by how wide they are. Stream width tells us about the amount of habitat available for fish and about how much water a stream might be able to hold. Bank full width is measured at the high water line. The high water line is where the rooted vegetation starts at the stream bank. When we measure the bank full width, we'll go to either bank of the stream and look out for where we see plants. We know rooted plants don't like to be fully submerged underwater all the time, so this line tells us where the water hits when the stream is full of water. Bank full width also tells us the maximum width of the stream that is available for salmon to swim during high water events. When do you think high water happens? Every day? Only during certain seasons? During storms? Think back to what influences the amount of water in a stream at a given time. The wetted width describes the boundaries of where there is water in the stream when you're actually measuring it. So the wetted width tells us the width of the habitat that is currently available for salmon or fish to use. Think about how often this changes. Great work today. Let's take a break, then meet back here to continue talking about freshwater habitats for Pacific salmon. Maria and I will make sure to stretch for next time because we have even more fun activities to show you in the field. The Thalwig is an imaginary line in a river that follows the path of the deepest water flow. This is also where the force of the water is strongest, so it is where erosion is happening. Like in a winding river, the Thalwig isn't in the center of the stream, but will tend to be towards the outside edge of a curve as it scours the bank. Since stream velocity, or the speed of the water, is typically highest at the Thalwig, you need to measure at different points across the stream to get the average velocity of the stream. Since rivers are just water moving down a slope, gradient is important to consider. Gradient is the steepness of a slope and usually describes the steepness as a percentage. The higher the percentage, the steeper the gradient of the river. Gradient is related to how fast the water flows downstream and the gravity is the force that pulls the water down the slope, just like how a ball would roll down a hill. So let's take a look at how we can easily measure how fast water is moving in a stream. The amount of water in a stream changes a lot throughout the seasons. The more water in a stream, the faster it will flow. In North America, spring and fall are typically seasons when precipitation is highest. This could be in the form of rain or snow. In the summertime, it rains less and the sun is hot, which makes the water in streams evaporate and reduces the flow even more. Climate change has made our winters warmer and shorter, which means smaller glaciers and less snowpack. When this ice and snow melts when the sun hits it in the springtime, rivers get a big surge of fresh water flowing through. When the glaciers get smaller though, stream levels can get really low and even dry up. Less precipitation in the summer causes low flow periods as well. Do you think it changes throughout the day too? See for yourself. We measured stream velocity once every hour for a whole day. Try putting these values into a graph to see how the stream velocity changed throughout the day. What are some reasons why stream velocity might change over one day? Revisit the stream width exercise. 
What do you think you would see if you measured the wetted width every hour and graphed it with the stream velocity? Plot the values we collected into a graph to see how the stream velocity changed. When water flows downstream, it carries a lot of force. A fast flowing river will pick up particles from the ground that the water flows over and carry it long distances downstream. That means silt, sand, and rocks. That material underneath the flowing water is called bed material or substrate. The faster the flow of water in a stream, the bigger the materials it can carry with it. The force of the flowing water can also change the substrate by moving it around and grinding down on the particles to make them smoother. The makeup of a stream substrate is important for salmon, especially when they're ready to spawn. Salmon lay their eggs in the stream's bed material, but it has to be just the right size to protect those precious eggs. We call the areas where salmon choose to lay their eggs spawning gravel, and each type of salmon have a preference of what size of rocks they like to have in their spawning beds. Other factors determine how salmon select sites to spawn, including depth and velocity. So sockeye salmon, for example, like to spawn in pretty shallow waters that aren't flowing too fast. They could spawn in a wide range of substrate sizes, but not too small. Steelhead, on the other hand, prefer to spawn in waters that are a little deeper, and their eggs would be safer in a wide range of substrate sizes, even with gravel that is as small as peppercorns. Riparian zones are the areas of vegetation on either side of a river or other moving water. Usually, we characterize the riparian zone by the vegetation cover within 20 meters of the stream channel. In Canada, riparian forests can be coniferous, deciduous, or mixed, or could be a mixture of shrubs and grasses. The roots of these plants help to hold on to the soil and provide stability to the banks of the rivers. Without that riparian vegetation hanging over the stream, the water can get pretty warm. Riparian trees and overhanging vegetation can shade the river from the hot sun, providing cover for salmon and other animals in the stream. Insects also like to live in the riparian soils and on the riparian plants. These can be a yummy snack for salmon swimming by. Overhanging trees also drop their leaves and other debris into the stream. This adds nutrients for aquatic insects and other small organisms to eat. Crown closure is one way to estimate how much the riparian zone covers and shades the stream. Okay. Estimate crown closure by looking up and making a circle with your thumb and index finger. How much percentage of the circle is blue sky? How much is covered by leaves and branches from the trees above? What influence does this have on the stream habitat for salmon? Does it change in different parts of the stream? Next time you're in a forest or a park, try it out. Have you ever wondered why there are dead trees or big branches in streams? How did they get there? Should someone take them out? Well, those trees, logs, branches, and root wads, or dead wood, are called large woody debris, or LWD, and they play a huge role in creating habitat for salmon, insects, and amphibians. To be considered LWD, the wood has to extend into the bankful channel. Remember, that's the high water line. That way, it influences the habitat directly. LWD is usually at least 2 meters in length and at least 10 centimeters thick. LWD comes into the channel from the riparian areas around the stream, or it gets carried down the river from other riparian areas upstream. Live trees can crash over and enter the stream in storms. This is called windfall or in landslide events where the soil beneath them gives out and slides downhill. This is called a mass wasting event. Sometimes you'll see logs that look like they have been cut. Those logs might have come into the stream after being cut down from logging activities. Salmon like a lot of LWD. LWD helps to create those habitat components by changing the course of the water's flow. When water flows around obstructions like LWD, the force of the water erodes the sediment in some areas and drops off sediment in others. So this creates scour pools and lots of complexity just by diverting the flow. Larger pieces of wood can also act as a place for riparian vegetation to grow. It can also stabilize the banks and can shelter parts of the stream, 
and this can shade them from the hot sun and even give them places to hide from predators. Insects really like LWD too. They'll slowly eat away at the dead wood in the streams, and some of those insects might even get eaten up by salmon in the stream below. Depending on the type of wood, it can take up to 20 years or more for LWD to break down in streams. Some softer deciduous woods like cottonwood or maple trees might take two years or less to break down. Show us what you've learned about freshwater habitats. Use your creativity to create a stream labeled with all the components that we discussed. Draw, paint, build a model, find a creative way to show what you learned. Bonus points for including plants that you could find in your local watershed. We're gonna set up a little race course to find out just how fast the water is flowing in the stream. We're wearing our waders with waist belts today and a life jacket for safety. We can use our measuring tape to see how wide the river is. I'm going to put up posts for our velocity test and we're gonna have them on the start and at the finish line. When you're ready for the race to begin, have one person stand at the finish line with a stopwatch while the other person stands at the starting line ready to release the rubber ducky. When the person with the stopwatch says go, start the timer and release the rubber ducky from the starting line. When the ducky crosses the finish line, stop the timer and record the time of the race on your data sheet. Okay. Remember that the fallwag is the area of the stream where the water flows the fastest? I wonder if the ducky race would take more or less time if we started from different spots across the starting line. If the middle of the stream here is a thalweg, will the ducky move slower or faster if it starts away from the middle? Let's do our race three more times. Once from the middle, once from the one meter mark, and once from the four meter mark. 